and um, feeling energetic. We have four presentations in different parts of the world. And we'll be discussing case studies, how evidences from case studies could be used in decision making. And I invite the speakers. We have about um, 80 minutes, and uh, this session is live. It's been um, live webcast. And uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, according to your time zone. My name is Aruna. I'm from India. I'm an anthropologist applying anthropological lens in the domain of public health. And um, I'm thankful that we are able to hold this session in Pio Cruz. We are thankful to the organizers, thankful to the audience, and also thankful to the presenters for bringing beautiful studies, interesting studies from across the globe. And I was thinking, like, you know, in the morning I was just reading through the abstracts, and okay, most of the studies are from South America, but it looks like no, we have also a study uh, presentation from Africa. So I would invite one after the other, and the kind of some points, some housekeeping points. Um, four presentation, 10 minutes each. And I think um, I will give you some indication that you're nearing your time. And followed by that, we have about 10 minutes each, or we can kind of club 10 minutes of Q&A or 15 minutes of Q&A. And I was also thinking it is interesting that we don't get to meet um, you know, speakers and audience in this kind of uh, collaboration or in kind of a interaction every day. So why not also put up some kind of a discussion? And um, so after the presentation we go over, we would also like to hear about, not just from the presenters, but also audiences' experience who have engaged um, using case studies and tried to influence policy de decisions. What kind of experience was was that? Was it? Uh, and how did you strategize those? And how do we ha how do we see scope for that, those uh, issues? You know, or or ideas or suggestions. So is that all right? Are we together? And how many uh, presentation? I mean, how many participants uh, are there in our um, in our um, how do I say virtual forum platform? Can we see that? Okay, so we, okay, so how do we know their questions? Like that is also something I need to, okay, thank you so much. So uh, the first presenter is Gloria. She told me don't bother about pronunciation and um, she's, she will, um, she's okay to, uh, I mean, if I'm saying in Indian accent, Gloria, she's happy. She comes from Peru and she has a, degree, she is multidisciplinary. She has a degree in um, nursing, followed by public health, and also health ethics. And um, she studied in Peruvian University, followed by Belgium, the, uh, the uh, Institute of Public Health in Antwerp. And uh, her ethics training is from NIH, uh, USA. And she works with Peruvian NIH. What she is bringing today for us is her study based, in, um, based among uh, indigenous population in Peru. Over to you, Gloria, and you have 10 minutes. She will speak in English. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gloria Carmona. I work in the Peruvian National Institute of Health as a researcher. Now I'm going to talk about a uh, mixed uh, qualitative study that was developed with indigenous community in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, I'm going to focus in the I'm going to be focused in the item relating to informal decision making. So this study started because it was a necessity of the Ministry of Health. This indigenous community have an, an outbreak of wheel rabies that was caused by bats. So the Ministry of Health have a vaccine and they were 
to do the, the campaign. But the indigenous community uh, refused to accept the, the vaccine. So when we start this study, uh, the decision makers have an initial concept that could explain this. And this potential explanation is that the indigenous community, they have a specific beliefs about religious or holistic issues, about aircraft or witches. And that maybe this is, these were the reason because they refused. This was a potential explanation, but maybe yes, maybe not. So in order to do this, um, my team with me decide to go to these places, but I start to build the, the framework. I mean, we use a theoretic, uh, theoretical framework that was the health model belief, but we recognize that this model doesn't respond uh, to our local context. So we need to develop an adaptation. And for this, we involve the community participation. And they start to participate, we start to talk with them. And we realize that, that, we, that, w that were several gaps that we don't have information really about. That the evidence that was available at that moment doesn't represent what, it, what was happening there. So the participation of these uh, communities that were represented by the APUS, APUS is the name of the leaders of the indigenous community hmm? and a specific community members too. The participation of them were so strong and some local health providers that was a nurse and uh, a technical nurse that, that the team uh, agreed that they need to be researchers because their contributions were, were really important. So for that, we have a barrier because we went to the IRB in the protocol and we present these people as, our, as part of our team. And the IRB say, respond to us, how these people could be researchers if they don't accomplish the three requirements that researchers need to, come, to accomplish. So you have to develop the study just by, by your team. And we reply that if we do that, uh, the results, uh, the validity of the results will decrease because it will not have in consideration the context, the specific context. This was a negotiation and in the end the IRB support us and we start to, to work. This was the first step for the informed decision maker that came later. We developed the interviews, the, the focus group, uh, the informal conversations. We triangulate information, all the, the methodology that you could find in the paper. But after that, when we start to develop the, the analysis, the analysis were discussed with all our team. It includes the APUS, the local health providers and indigenous participants that were not part of the final sample because it would imply a bias. So we developed the framework, we, we make our initial uh, explanations, but then when, the, when we went to the community, we, we were able to have a more appropriate interpretations of the results. And that increased the validity of the study. And it increased too the skills of the community because they started to think in a critical way about the problem and about the reasons that are related to this issue to refuse to the vaccine. About these skills that was expressed in the community, we find too the multiply effect because they start to spread the result of the researchers with their peers. This is another way to translate evidence into behaviors. It's not just with papers. So 
we finally, uh, when we have the final report, we will return to this community to share our results with all the, with the six indigenous community that participate. And after that, we continue refining. I mean, this process of qualitative studies, you go and back, go and back in order to refine the methodology. So after that, uh, the institution, the, the NIH, the Peruvian NIH as several institutions want to see indicators. And one of these indicators are papers. Mm -hmm. So they start to say, where is the paper? Uh, we reply, the paper is coming, it's coming, but it was not ready yet. So, but in the end, the paper was, uh, was published in an index journal, in a Brazilian index journal. And, okay, I have three minutes, three minutes. Mm. So, this process uh, improved the skills of the researchers because it was my first experience with the indigenous community. I already received training in mixed studies, but it was my first experience uh, with these communities. But I could improve my knowledge because I work with them. In the community, they improve their skills too because they, start, they developed a critical thinking about their problems. They uh, realize a multiply effect of their findings with their peers. And several years later, I mean, it could be like three, four years later, the persons that, the people that was part of, of my research team, team, that in that time were local providers in very far, far away communities, they became uh, stakeholders. They, they are now the decision maker in this region. And they use the findings of this study for their actual policies that are applied in this regional context. So, what I, uh, another uh, indicator or impact that this has is that since that now, if you are going to, okay. Now, when the Peruvian NIH want to develop a protocol in the, with the indigenous community, the indigenous community require to participate since the beginning. We have experience where some researchers, some high qualified researchers, they have the protocols with IRB approvals. I then went to the to the indigenous community, and they say, we are going to do this because you need this, and we already have an, an IRB. But now the, this six indigenous community says not. If you want to do, we can do it, but we need to participate since the beginning. Please explain us how is the process. We need to be involved. So I think that it is, that it reflects a positive impact because in Peru, with indigenous community, we have a very special and tricky communication where in the majority, in the majority of cases, uh, the government is out. So this is the experience. Uh, this is what I want to show how qualitative evidence could help in the policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, so as I was saying before that we'll take all the questions uh, later together. So I invite the next presenter, Christian. He's coming all the way from Chile. He is an engineer by background and for his undergrad and postgrad. And then he is pursuing um, health policy research as his PhD in McMaster University, Canada. So he's bringing studies that he has done with the government of Chile and informing health policy for us. 
Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Aruna. So yeah, I'm not, although coming all my way from Chile, but <laughs> because I'm like, I just recently joined my master now, so I'm just like, so this study will be the, thank you, will be um, one of the studies that we conducted where I was just working as part of my work at the Ministry of Health back in Chile. And this is the rest of the authors that I just like very uh, acknowledge them like from the beginning. So let me just like briefly like talk to you about the agenda for today. So I would just like introduce the issue that I would just talk about. And then like I could just give you a few of the concept. I don't know how many of you are, are actually pharmacists here. I'm not a pharmacist, so I had a very hard time to actually get into all of this concept that I will just be using to understand this research. Then I will just go over the methods, the results, and actually just conclude with a, a few remarks on what is like important on what uh, gives this research for policy making and some implications for policy making and research as well. So, so at the beginning, so pharmaceutical uh, spending is one of the main drivers for health spending in total. And this is like, if we could just take the, 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 um, the case of OECD countries, it's 25% of the total health spending is explained by, by uh, pharmaceutical. Um, if we now talk about Chile, we have also a big issue with out-of-pocket expenditure, which is actually an important part of this health spending. It's around 33%, which is far beyond the 10 or 20 or 15% that the WHO recommends for that. And 31% in Chile of this out-of-pocket expenditure is actually explained by medicines. So that's why many governments like across the world have seen access to medicines as a main issue, as a main strategy actually to reduce inequalities and also promote universal health coverage in this sense. And among all the actions that government could have to promote access to medicines, um, substitution policies are one of the main strategies that is used all over the world. And the, the important part of this and the main aim of this uh, intervention is to reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure for the population. But let's start with like explaining to you. No. Maybe I just. Yeah. What are substitution policies? So um, this is like a, a, just a, a very simple comparison. Forgive me if there's any pharmacists here. but. Uh, so basically the idea is to promote the use of generic medicines in comparison to branded drugs with the main aim to reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure. So these policies usually work under two main assumptions. So the first one is that generic drugs would actually are cheaper than original ones, right? And the second like main assumption of this is that the generic drugs will actually be the same quality as the original, right? So then we'll just switch from one drug to another and the out-of-pocket expenditure will be actually reduced on that population. So I would just like to briefly refer to the, um, to the second assumption be because like this quality is actually sometimes granted for some governments. So all the drugs that are actually sold in some countries are the same quality and we just, when we talk about generics, we assume that they're actually the same quality. But it's not always true if you are in a country like Chile, where uh, like before you have a lot of generics that are being sold there, but you had never questioned their quality before. So then we started to say, okay, let's move beyond that. So, but what we understand by quality? Um, this is when the equivalence comes. So the equivalence is the pharmaceutical concept of quality. And it's used as an adjective, not a noun, because it's a, it, it makes you like easier the comparison between two drugs based on the therapeutical equivalence. So basically, two drugs will be the equivalent if they produce the same therapeutic effects under a patient. And this is seen as a transition system. So all the system will have, all the medicines will eventually become the equivalent, right? But there is a transition on that and how governments enforce like to produce this transition system to become all the generics be equivalent on this is to 
create list of active pharmaceutical ingredients, lists of APIs or molecules that and a specific due dates for them to become the equivalent. So basically they will just publish several APIs, several molecules that they need to be the equivalent, need to be the same quality as original, right? After a specific due date. And if something, if some product with some molecule would like to be sold in the market after that due date, it's not possible. They are, they are commanded to, be, to withdraw from the market, basically. So what happened to this, like, with, after this law in Chile? We had chaos, basically. <laughs> so we had several newspapers, several magazines, several, like, policy issues, many interests here, like, conflicting each other on this because, like, probably this policy w was actually an, a, a big mistake of the government. This policy brought, like, a lot of confusion. This policy, like, actually increased the prices of the medicine. We had a lot of stockouts on this. And this actually uh, motivates the research that I'm presenting today because we actually say, okay, let's dig into that. Let's put some evidence on this. What was actually happened? Like, did it, like, actually the, this policy work on that? So then we designed, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> an evaluation, an impact evaluation of this policy. And this was the first, I, I'm not talking about this today because this is, right, a qualitative evidence symposium, right? So uh, this is a quantitative evaluation study that motivates the qualitative evidence uh, that I will be presenting. So basically in this uh, slide we could just see how this, uh, in this graph, the, um, the original, the volume sold of the original medicines actually was reduced after the implementation of the project, right, the, the, the policy, which is seen after this vertical line. And we also saw that some medicines actually went out of the market because like the, the pharmaceutical companies of that like decided to just be out of that. Um, so yeah, so, so then this motivated our research question that was mainly what are the factors that were explaining actually this result that we saw in this, uh, in this very first um, quantitative method study. And we designed a qualitative explanatory study using a realistic evaluation approach. Um, we used semi structure interview with nominal group, a proposed sample of many actors in the, in the, uh, like that were related to pharmaceutical policies. Then we analyzed the data in three main categories and effect the design and implementation issues on, on this policy. And we separated the result like highlighting the main point of consensus and the main point of, like, of differences between actors. So I will just go to the result. We had 21 uh, interviews and we had three nominal groups that were used in a seminar where we were represented the quantitative results of the previous phase. Um, so the results like a structure in these three main domain, I will just start with the policy effects, which, which was basically like orientated by the first part of the quantitative part, right, the evaluation effect of that, but then we just like kind of like were thinking of what are the main barriers, what are the main like factors that are explaining these results, right? Um, so we found that for the, for, the, for the entire part of the actors, like um, the, quality, the quality of the medicines, like they say that actually increase in the market, so then we have a better quality medicines on this. Then the V equivalence, the, the quality of the medicine was actually positioned as, a, as an important issue for the pharmaceutical policies. It was like, like an, an important effect for everyone on this. And it's unlikely, we didn't me measure that on, on the quantitative part, but it is unlikely, and many actors said that like, they actually, uh, the medicine price was like, not affected by this uh, policy. And there was also some stock out, some supply issues that they, many actors just uh, had a consensus that that was actually happening. Um, so then for the policy design issues, so um, um, there was a lack of institutional me partic participatory mechanism. So, and that was also like, like argued by the industry because they say that they didn't like were considered in terms of what are the characteristic of the market, of each market that, that could produce some stock out for that. And the main goal for that, for this policy, was promoted the access to medicine, which was actually uh, contrasted by, by the communication goals that had the government at that point. And about the policy implementation, that it was insufficient monitoring and evaluation, 
and there was a lack of proper coordination be between different institutions that were involved in that. Um, and the communication was actually wrongly uh, created on that because like, it was strongly uh, communicated that the price was actually the main aim on that when, when it uh, was actually like a bad thing. It, it, it didn't really happen on that. I'm out of time probably, but I'll just conclusions. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the, the main conclusions of this research is probably related to how the lack of participation and the coordination of, of between institutions were two implementation factors that actually could explain the result that we saw in the quantitative evidence. Um, this is one of the main issues, and this is the selection of medicines. How were they selected to be incorporated in this transition process is actually a main issue. The, and the price of the medicine was actually mainly communicated to the, to the, to the population, and that, was, uh, that created a huge expectation for them that was actually not fulfilled for them. And this is a very good example of how qualitative evidence actually informed a specific question after a quantitative uh, impact evaluation study um, was conducted. Um, just like a few mentioned that a bill is currently being discussed in the parliament, like regarding, an, uh, especially like uh, not like directly related after this research, but it's actually like something that is being discussed on the, on the, on the Congress in Chile at this moment. Um, and further research is needed to, to explore the effect of price. I think there's a lot, a huge issue and, and many controversies regarding price on this and it's totally worth to dig into that. And it also like a, an important issue that we didn't see that coming from the, from the interviews and from the qualitative da data was the, the, the perception of prescriptors in terms of the quality of generics. And we saw that there's a lot of literature on that too, uh, that could inform that. So this like, just, this is my last slide. <laughs> so there was like two publications on that and this acknowledgement for the people that was also funding this work and participated in this. Thank you, sorry for being a bit late. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Uh, moving on to the next presenter, uh, we have Chiara Pitalis. She's from Ireland, and she's a researcher. Her work is based in Africa, and she would be talking about a study to discuss improvement in surgical care. Over to you, Peter, um, Chiara. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chiara Pitalis. I'm from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And we are currently leading a consortium uh, of partners from six different countries in uh, the implementation of a research project which aims to improve surgical capacity in rural Africa. And the project is called Surge Africa. It's an implementation research project and uses mixed methods. So I'm here today to talk to you about the qualitative aspect of the project and how we're using this to collect better evidence and to uh, inform better policy making. But before I go into the details of the project, let me give you a little bit of background about our work. So our research falls under what is known as global surgery, which is an emerging team in research and gained momentum in 2015 when the international community came together under the Lancet Commission in, on Global Surgery to take stock of surgical care across the world. And they found that five billion people worldwide lack access to safe surgical care. So this is a huge number. Following this uh, report, the WHO uh, decided to issue a um, resolution which officially recognized that surgery is an essential component of surgical, of, sorry, of um, universal health coverage. And it's also essential in reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases. So it's a very surgery is very important in achieving two of the key targets of goal three of the SDGs. So uh, the next slide uh, just shows some of the headlines in the news agencies. Uh, as I said, this is a new topic, so it's gaining more and more attention in the media. And uh, the key messages from the report of the Lancet Commission is that five billion people lack access to surgical care. Africa is the most affected region. Surgical conditions account for 30% of the global disease burden and they kill more people than HIV, TB, and malaria together. Just to give you a visual, the blue men in the graph there uh, represent the volume of deaths 
per year due to HIV, TB, and malaria. While the red man uh, on the other side shows the volume of people dying every year due to surgical conditions. So it's a very big uh, difference in the, in, in the problem. So our project, uh, as I mentioned earlier, tries to improve surgical capacity in Africa, and we concentrate on rural um, areas. So we work with district hospitals. The reason to work in rural areas is because in Africa, most of the population lives in rural areas. The percentage for the region is 63%, but in the countries where we work, which is Malawi, Zambia, and Tanzania, the percentage of the population in rural areas is much higher. In Malawi, we are nearly 84%, I think. So this is where the met need is the greatest. And um, before we could improve surgical capacity, so before designing the intervention, we needed to carry out a situation assessment. So we needed to know where are the gaps. Uh, we undertook a variety of different studies uh, on different aspects of surgical care, and one of those was anesthesia. So I'm going to talk about anesthesia in the next slide as an example of how our methodology informed um, our intervention and also our engagement with policymakers in the three countries. And uh, just for the information of mm, those of you who might not be familiar with Africa, so in Africa most of um, providers, specialists uh, in anesthesia are located in uh, cities. So in rural areas, in the district hospitals, anesthesia is usually provided by non-doctors and nurses. They, are, they, are, they study anesthesia, so they have the basic knowledge, but their qualifications are lower than the specialists. And they often work in resource-limited conditions. Uh, so our situation assessment was carried out in 2017. As I said, we use a mixed methods. The quantitative part of the study involved a survey in 76 hospitals across the three countries. And uh, there weren't many tools uh, available to us to assess surgical capacity in Africa, so we picked one that allowed us to assign a numerical value to surgical capacity so that we could compare um, the scores across facilities, across countries, and um, over time. But we knew that this had some limitations because we've been working in Africa for several years, so we, we, we know the situation is quite complex in rural areas. So we complemented the survey with a qualitative component, which involved, first of all, adding an annex to the survey. So the, mm, we added some open-ended questions on some of the variables in the survey so that we could find additional information. And also we carried out semi-structured interviews in 33 hospitals, so delve deeper into the issues affecting surgical care. So here are the results. The survey found, uh, so we calculated an index score for each hospital and each of the three countries. And the index score, as you can see from the figures, is similar across the three countries. We didn't find any significant difference. So that means they're comparable. Um, but just to give you um, a bit more information about those numbers, what they mean, the score, the minimum score is zero. So if the hospitals don't have any capacity, they will score zero. There is no uh, maximum, there is no maximum score because it is driven by the number of staff in the hospital, so that is not fixed. Uh, but when we assessed uh, the 76 hospitals, none of them met international minimum safety standards in anesthesia. So those scores are actually low across the three countries. So does that mean that the three countries are equally lagging behind in service provision because they're scoring similarly, uh, similar levels? The answer to this question is no, because when we looked at the qualitative uh, findings in our analysis, we found significant differences across the three countries, and those have important implications for decision makers. So in Zambia, um, staff numbers are generally low. We calculated the ratio of anesthesia providers to surgical providers. This is one to two. So on paper, that doesn't sound too bad. So it means there is one anesthetist for every two surgical providers. But when we talk to the clinicians on the ground, they explain that this is actually a problem for them because the staff numbers are so low that there might be only one anesthetist in the hospital. So if this person is not uh, on duty because he can't work 24-7, what happens to the patients? Somebody has to look after them, especially if it's an emergency. So uh, as the respondent, respondent explained, um, somebody else has to take over. Somebody else who is not an expert in anesthesia. So that means risks for patients because they might not be able to handle a complication or if there is an adverse event. So this is something that needs to be prioritized in Zambia. 
in Malawi, from the interviews, two issues um, came up. The staff numbers are generally low compared to the other countries, so it, th th this is not an issue. But when we talk to the clinicians, they notice that they, they, they argue that the skill levels are an issue because there is an imbalance between the skill level of the surgical providers and those of the anesthetists. So one of the doctors was telling us sometimes he gets operations and uh, he might be able to do them, but because the anesthetist doesn't know that particular procedure, the anesthesia for that particular procedure, they can't perform the operation. So the hospital is not working at its maximum capacity because of the skills. Likewise, uh, the survey showed that there were some gaps in uh, availability of equipment and infrastructure, but the interviews revealed what is the effect of those gaps, of what are the additional um, factors affecting those gaps. Uh, one of the um, respondents noticed that um, even if in the survey they said, yes, we do have an anesthesia machine, if there are multiple theaters and there is only one anesthesia machine, they cannot uh, operate at full capacity, so they might not be able to use the second theater. Um, so that means that the demand for surgery is not met. Um, a second point they made during the interviews is that sometimes the anesthesia machines are old models. So there might be some operations that require advanced anesthesia and they cannot perform them with these old models. So even if the survey says the machines are there, that doesn't mean that they are what the patients and the surgeons need. And finally, in Tanzania, uh, there was not one particular issue um, emerging from the interviews. There were a, a range of them. Uh, but one thing that, for example, may uh, differentiated the situation in Tanzania compared to the other countries is the anesthesia drugs. Uh, again, the survey just picked up whether the drugs were there or not, but the interviews revealed further issues with those drugs. Uh, for example, uh, the type of drugs they are supplied is, um, is old. They're, they don't have the, the latest models, the latest, the latest types of drugs. So that means that the old drugs uh, tend to have more complications, more side effects. So that is a, uh, th might be an issue for the patients. Uh, sometimes they don't have the right type of drug for the particular procedures because the decisions are made at a higher level, the, the, the purchasing decisions. And as you can see from the last quotation, the anesthetics is not always consulted on what drugs do they need on the ground. So there is a mismatch between what's needed in the hospital and who is whoever is planning the supply of drugs to the hospital. So this is a priority for policy making in Tanzania. So just to conclude, all of the three countries are falling short of ensuring universal access to safe surgical care, uh, but relying only on quantitative measures uh, does not give you the full picture. So it's very important to use uh, new approaches, different approaches, and in our experience, the qualitative aspect of the project really gave us a better insight into the situation on the ground. And this is something maybe specific to global surgery because it's a relatively new area in research, so most of the researchers working in global surgery come from a clinical background, so they come from a quantitative background, and they might not be so open to qualitative methods. But in our case, our team is multidisciplinary. We have social science, economists, uh, obviously surgeons, but uh, so multiple disciplines, so we were able to bring together different views into the project, and that really helped us with the design of the intervention and also with our engagement with the policymakers. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, oh, moving over to the last, the fourth presenter. She's Marcela Velez from Colombia. She's a professor and researcher at the University of Antiquia School of Medicine. She is a physician with a master's degree in clinical epidemiology and a PhD in health policy. She would be presenting her doctoral work, which explores social values, the whys and hows of social values and how they affect decision making in policy, in health financing especially. Over to you, Marcela. Uh, good afternoon. We are the survivors of this of this day. I think that is the last presentation of this conference. No? Oh, okay. Oh. Um, 
Okay, so I want to begin this presentation with a definition that I used uh, in my session this morning because it's important. In fact, I am going to use three or four of the, my previous slides. So I want to clarify that we use a definition of values that is here, that values are principles or criteria for selecting what is good or better or the best. So we are thinking that values is something that is positive to make decision. Uh, we are focused principally in social and political values that the, are the values that are used to make decisions in the society. So as I explained it in the session before, so values are important. We know that from the evidence that are important at all the stages of the policy process, in agenda, in policy development, and implementation and evaluation. But we are not clear, we don't have all the information about how they are incorporated in the decision making. So we are trying to explore this with li three different studies. And for us, it's, um, in Latin America, it's an emerging field. So our question for this study is, how and under what conditions socially and politically declared values are used in making decisions about health system financing in two specific countries in Latin America, that are Chile and Colombia, for four decisions. So our design is a big design that is a case study, a multiple case study with two countries and four decisions. And how the values are used in each decisions are our cases. And in this uh, multiple case study, we have a discourse analysis that this is, this is a study that is focused in policy documents and media that is here, policy documents and media, and that is the information that we use to understand the discourse of the policymakers and the stakeholders and the media and the citizens. And in a third study, we explore with these same cases uh, the interviews to policymakers and the stakeholders to understand the views of the people about those values. So here is the discourse. So the scope is four decisions, two in Colombia, two in Chile. The type of values, again, are declared values because are the values that are explicitly described in the policy documents and in the media. And we connect to this study with a, one previous, that is the development of a framework that we did through a critical interpretive synthesis, and a third study that is um, with interviews. So the methodology. So we select the cases, and the cases, yeah, it's working. Uh, so two cases in Chile, two cases, or two decisions in Chile, and two decisions in Colombia. In Chile, one of the decisions is the development and implementation of the universal plan of explicit entitlements, that is the AUGE plan. That is like a decision that is trying to prioritize, uh, at the beginning, 50 diseases and conditions that are prioritized to be to universal coverage in the country for all the patients and independently of the, of the insurance, if it's public insurance or private insurance. The second decision is the Ricardo Soto law that is a law trying to uh, provide high cost technologies and procedures to the citizens in the country. And in Colombia, the decisions are the declaration of health as a fundamental right that is very important in Colombia. In Colombia, uh, the judiciary branch, the judiciary system has a strong role in the policy, in the health policy development. So that was an important decision. And the second decision is a mechanism that was established to decide which is considered to be uh, financed with public resources in the health system, uh, which is out. So to include and exclude technologies in something like an, a benefits plan. So the steps for our search process, in this discourse analysis, we use documents and media. Uh, we use four steps to find the evidence. So the first one, uh, we explore something that is a database that is Nexus Lexus, that is like a, a database that compile information from magazines and newspapers. And we try to find there these decisions in that databases 
and then we move it to search the decisions in each paper in each country, in the big newspapers of the countries, in the big uh, magazines in each country, and then we move it to explore the websites of the um, Congress, the Minister of Health, the different important stakeholders. Then of that, we move it to ask to um, experts about which other documents we should consult or explore to have all the information and the full picture of the discourse. We use it as a selection criteria that is related with the richness of the papers that we are including and the perceptions and visions. And then uh, we selected the uh, papers that are, have more information about this issue. So we make a thematic analysis, we synthesize the findings, and of course we have a lot of reflexivity here. We use it, um, the policy process cycle to understand how values were used or in agenda setting or in policy development or in each of the stages, but we also use a kingdom agenda setting that is a framework, oh my goodness, that is a framework that explains how the issues come to be important in the policy, in the government agenda. Mm -hmm. So three factors are here important, problems, policies, and politics. And we use a three I's plus E framework, other framework to explain how uh, policies are developed. So um, we identify 376 papers, 149 in Chile, and 200 in Colombia. Um, we purposely sampled a good sample of them. So we have here in dark blue the papers that were excluded and the papers that were included by GR. So we have a good representation of different GRs. And we have different kinds of papers. So some of them are hearings, uh, policy documents, uh, media documents, and some information of uh, stakeholders groups. So we identify in our, in our critical interpretive synthesis uh, 116 values, and here we are um, testing this framework that we developed that is uh, um, considered goal-related values, values that are important for the health system, technical values that are values to make uh, the decision sustainable, uh, governance values that are values that are important to make the process of the decision making transparent and situational values that are other values that come to be important dependent on different factors. So in our analysis, we have analysis within each decision, between decisions in each country and across country decisions. We have, we developed a timeline of the events in each country to understand when the values come to be important and from who the values come to be important in each country. And then we have a general analysis of those values. So we, for example, identify that in the decisions in the, in the case of Chile, the decisions that are important for the first decision for the AUGE plan is related with universality and quality. But when they move it to the Ricardo Soto law, that is this law for high technology, uh, procedures and technologies provided for all the people. The decision is different because they they need more uh, governance values. They need to decide with the participation of the citizens how to prioritize which conditions should receive this financing from the public sector. In the case of Colombia, for the first decision that is the declaration of health as a fundamental right, Human dignity was a very important value for the judiciary system, human dignity. So that is the reason, that is the value that they think is important to decide which is included in the health system and which is not included. And when we move it to the mechanisms for exclusions, technical values come to be very important because we are saying we uh, are prioritizing to exclude the things that are cosmetic, that are not effective or not safety for the patients. So we have different kinds of values that inform each decision and play a different role. So um, this is the explanation that I give you. So 
We have the same idea that I explained it before. Stakeholders and policymakers use value for very different things. We, at, uh, in comparison with our, our previous study, we do not find a lot of values in the documents, but it still is a big list of values that are supposed to be used in the policy documents. But we found that in our case study with interviews, that really policymakers only use one or two values, commonly two values to try to balance the decision. So it's between equity and sustainability, or between cost effectiveness and universality. It's like a, something like that. So we have strengths and limitations um, that is related with the cases. Uh, in the case of the limitations, for example, the Ricardo Soto law and the mechanisms for exclusions are very new decisions in Colombia. So we have not the full picture of all the things that are important there. And we think that the framework and this discussion is important to understand the role of values in the decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela, for finishing in time. And I think your presentation was really nice. Um, over to the audience. Um, we are kind of running behind time and have about um, 20 minutes. Um, so questions, and you tell your name, and be very precise. And you can direct it to the presenter you wish to ask from. Questions, please. So no questions. Does it mean you're not interested, or you are you understood everything, or you didn't like, or you're very impressed that you're speechless? What happened? Really? So you oh I see a hand. Yes, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Uh, Gloria, esta pre eh, la, quisiera hacer un cuestionamiento, no es un cuestionamiento, una pregunta más bien. ¿Cómo es la forma? Ay, sorry. Eh, Emily Vargas de Colombia. Ahora sí, Gloria. Eh, en Colombia nosotros tenemos que seguir un proceso muy arduo, legal, para poder empezar a hacer estudios con indígenas, afrocolombianos y población con enfoque diferencial. No quiero decir que este proceso sea eh, complicado o que esté perjudicando el desarrollo de investigación, todo lo contrario, lo que busca es eh, tener el, digamos, el consentimiento de ellos para ingresar a su territorio y para empezar a, a tener eh, consultas y, y con ellos, ¿no? Eh, algo similar pasa en Perú, y ¿cómo es el proceso con ustedes allá? Me gustaría saber un poco sobre eso. Gracias por la pregunta, es una excelente pregunta. Sí, en Perú hay una situación eh, similar, cuando uno quiere, eh, cuando el Ministerio de Salud identifica una necesidad de investigación en comunidades indígenas, eh, esa necesidad es plasmada porque eh, los políticos o las autoridades regionales transmitieron esta necesidad. Entonces llega el Ministerio de Salud y el Ministerio manda el requerimiento al INS, que es el lugar donde yo trabajo. ¿Sí? Eh, el INS lo designa a, pues, a la persona encargada, bueno en este caso me correspondió, y a partir de ahí hay que hacer una batería de negociaciones con el Ministerio de Poblaciones Vulnerables e Inclusión Social con los cuales también eh, tenemos que informar nuestra intención. ¿sí? Eh, con este ministerio ellos también eh, colaboran, no son necesariamente eh, investigadores, colaboran con, la, con el estudio y pasa por el IRB, pasa por dos IRBs, por el IRB del, del Instituto Nacional de Salud, ¿sí? que evalúa la, la pertenencia, si se está considerando estas cuestiones este, especiales, con las comunidades indígenas y también pasa con los IRBs, por ejemplo, de esta localidad específica. La comunidad indígena no tiene un comité de ética, pero la región donde pertenece sí. Pero ahí viene otro detalle, ¿no? los IRBs en las regiones puede que aún 
tengan algunas necesidades para hacer estos procesos realmente rigurosos. ¿no? Entonces, eso incrementa más el compromiso de los investigadores con la comunidad. Muchas veces la, los investigadores han ido de frente a ejecutar los protocolos con la comunidad sin consultarles por qué. Y las comunidades indígenas peruanas son muy renuantes a participar con nosotros porque el sistema de salud solamente se acerca a ellos cuando necesitan, cuando a la vez de ofrecer un servicio, también necesita algo de la comunidad. ¿no? La comunidad indígena es muy valiosa por miles de cosas, pero los gobiernos por lo general tienen intereses en sus suelos. ¿sí? Entonces, eh, pero cuando el gobierno le falla a la comunidad, la comunidad es muy aguerrida también. ¿no? Por eso es que este detalle era, fue muy difícil fue muy, o sea, ahora yo lo puedo decir porque ya pasó todo un tiempo, ¿no? Pero realmente fue un proceso, fue un desafío muy fuerte de manera personal y para, para el equipo, porque si nosotros lo hacíamos mal, o bueno, o rompíamos las relaciones con, lo, con estas comunidades, luego otros investigadores ya no iban a poder entrar. El acceso que nosotros hemos tenido es producto del de camino que empezaron a realizar gente que estuvo antes, ¿no? entonces es algo como que tenemos que, que continuar. Esa pregunta es para Marcela. Eh, Marcela, ustedes hicieron eh, revisión tanto de papers como de media, ¿no? Si están en su panel. De documentos políticos. De docu de, ¿Del documento de la política más papers? No, más media. Más media, o sea, como ah, los ok. Los documentos que produce el Ministerio, que producen las Secretarías de Salud, que producen los abogados, que produce el, el Corte Constitucional, ese tipo de documento ah. que no está publicado en revistas indexadas. Por sí, sí, ok, perfecto. Entonces, no, lo que yo quería ver era si habiesen con. Ya, yeah, the, the question is because I, I, yo no había entendido eso, pero la pregunta es, eh, en el análisis que viste, ¿hay una diferencia dentro de lo que los valores que eh, reflejaban más los medios y los que tú veías en los documentos de política, dado este posible interés que había de los medios de resaltar algunos valores diferentes a los que realmente estaban dentro de la política o no viste esa diferencia? Sí, hay diferencia porque lo que los tomadores de decisiones tienen en su mente sobre qué es importante no siempre se refleja en lo que el público cree que es importante con esa decisión o cómo la, los medios de comunicación posicionan el tema en, 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 en los medios de comunicación y cómo los grupos de interés también presionan por otras desde otros lados para posicionar otros valores eso, por ejemplo, es muy evidente en el caso de Chile con la ley Ricarte Soto, donde fue muy importante la movilización ciudadana, entonces ellos traen sus propios valores diferentes a los de la ley y que además termina la media, el, los medios de comunicación dándole prioridad a algunos de ellos, bien diferentes. Um, we have a question from the um, virtual uh, platform um, for the presentation on um, safe surgery. Uh, the question is, when you notice country level differences like you presented, it could be that at the time that you interviewed participants were not focused on a particular topic mentioned in another setting. That doesn't mean it wasn't also true in that context. Did you also have a chance to use the results to do any additional data collection um, prompting specifically about country differences observed? Let me think. This study was, taken, uh, was undertaken as part of a wider situation assessment of surgical care. So the survey and the questions were not specifically about anesthesia at the time. They were about surgical care, including anesthesia. So the findings that we found uh, that the, the represented, they came from the participants themselves. So those are the issues that affect them. 
and uh, especially when you work in these three hospitals, um, I think uh, co colleagues working in Africa might uh, confirm or not this, but um, the government or the, the decision makers don't always consult with the lower levels, especially rural hospitals. So for us, even having some information, some initial idea of what they think and what are their needs was a big um, achievement. The project is still ongoing. Um, we have, it's a four years project, so there are other studies and we will compare additional, we will collect additional information and make additional comparison across the, across the three countries. But this was the very, very first step, so it was limited in scope at the time. Any question from the audience? decision making and I just wanted to ask you a question about whether the panelists foresaw the potential to move us more towards what I would call rapid learning health and social systems. So one way we can get there is by making better use of existing synthesized or primary uh, qualitative research, but the other way might be by applying qualitative methods in a more rapid way. So Christiane, with your presentation I was struck by if policymakers didn't think about a policy decision as being something that got locked in for five or ten years, but instead saw it as a learning opportunity where they could be uh, trying things, learning from them, making adjustments, so many of what you put up they could have identified earlier had people been doing qualitative studies alongside. Similarly with the situation analysis, I got the impression it took place over a very long time and presumably then preceded a very long period of intervention, but those cycles could have been handled more quickly. And then Marcella, maybe turning to you, you brought evidence on values to the table. Could you imagine some of the methods you applied being done more rapidly to inform the process? So I think we can, we can support rapid learning and improvement if we draw on existing research, but is there the potential to also accelerate our application of qualitative methods? Thank you for the question, yeah. I think, yeah, I think in the qualitative evidence synthesis part, it's totally like a, an important issue, I think. So in this case, I remember we didn't like do a formal qualitative evidence synthesis, but we, we actually just like look into that. I just like briefly mentioned that, but there's many literature regarding the, the, the confidence that usually prescriptors put on the, the quality of the generics. So, and that, uh, and we were actually very surprised that this, that issue didn't come up from the results, but yeah, so that's one issue that could like co also inform like this process as well. And I totally think that the method could also be kind of like accelerated on that. I think there's maybe one issue. So, so yeah, so, so I think that we kind of like could split like here on what the findings will actually be translated directly to decision makers and what could actually follow the, the path of research, pure research, right? Because I, I see there is one main, po main point on that, which is REV probably, right? So if we just kind of like, I just totally see that if we could just like answer a specific qualitative question and we could just complement that for with, a, with some synthesis of the existing evidence on that and we would just complement that with key informant interviews, that could be totally fine. I could just rapidly move into that. But in the, if then if we just design a qualitative research like entirely with that, then the REB could definitely just like slow the pace of that process, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. In our case, I should have said, uh, we follow a participatory action research uh, approach. So um, we have regular meetings with all stakeholders. We had them at the start of the project when we were designing the intervention. And these included both uh, the clinicians on the ground, but also government representatives, uh, representatives of the surgical associa associations, anesthesia associations, and so on. So that gave us a good understanding of what was needed on the ground, and we were able to design the intervention accordingly. And moreover, as we go along, we have regular meetings with them. We have regular workshops. So these allow us to tweak the intervention 
as needed. Uh, it's not a clinical trial, so we have a little bit of flexibility. And uh, it also guides our research because uh, as we it's an implementation research project. So as we implement intervention, we're also evaluating as we go. So talking to the beneficiaries on a regular basis allow us to understand what are their priorities, what are their needs, is there an area of research that we need to look into. So that's why we have so many sub-studies because as we go along we, we realize it's such a complex environment and there are so many aspects that need to be looked at. So that, that's what helps us in our case. I think there are questions. Hi, yes, I have a question for um, Marcella. Um, is, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a really interesting and comprehensive analysis of the um, decisions um, that you were looking at. I'm wondering, um, so you were sort of talking about doing this analysis after, some time after a decision has been made so that there's time for the decision to be covered in the media and documented and whatnot. I'm wondering, um, do you think that there's any role for this type of analysis before a decision is being made or sort of closer to the time that the decision is made that you could use similar methods? I think that this is a very close question with the question of John. In fact, I am going to answer both. So, um, yes, so we are thinking, for example, how to help the policy makers to make better decisions and timely according with the values that are presented in the media. The media is very strong and they are not independently, they move a lot of values. So for example, in the last day we were discussing something related with the sugar beverage. Sugar beverage. Okay, okay, sweetness. And uh, we have this discussion because the government wants to have a law to try to regulate this beverage and you know that their interest group very strong and they mobilize their uh, interest and in the media comes to arrive this evidence and different um, arguments against this position of the government and we know that we are able to present evidence to try to change the values that people are perceiving in the policy but we are trying to convince to the policy makers that we can do that in a very um, uh, timely manner. But I think that is also important for the stakeholders, for the people that is trying to put things in the agenda. So we are trying to say, look, this is the, um, this is the situation. You have a window of opportunity. You can bring this issue here. You can frame the problem with this value. You can try, you can bring this kind of evidence, qualitative, quantitative. You can um, influence the decision making if you are able to put this value in the media or in the documents or in the discussion of the government. So for both uh, ways. Uh, we just, any more questions from the audience or virtual platform? Uh, I, I think we just have about little time and uh, as I was thinking we can also do a discussion around, you know, we oftentimes try to incorporate uh, qualitative evidence into policy making and uh, case studies are very strong ways of pushing our agenda to towards policy change so maybe our four presenters uh, you know there is a slide which talks about the like the barriers the, um, the obstacles that oftentimes we face maybe you know they can talk about their situation and we can also learn like or, or we can incorporate or strategize in our own settings so we have about, um, say, five to five to ten minutes to discuss that. Uh, Raji, can you have that second slide, um, the blank slide? Thank you. Yes. So maybe one by one we can discuss um, if you if you would like to discuss like what uh, what had been your challenges to incorporate your, um, you know, the, the one you wanted to incorporate into policy making or decision making. I would like to mention that in order to, to be able to make this process faster, that it doesn't take so long, I think that the first issue that could help to this is the experience when the researchers have the experience to develop a qualitative study and they gave the experience and the, com the community 
specific participants have the experience of improve their skill or to think in a critical way about an a specific clinical or public health issues. After the process ends, we reflect about how was this process. And in the next experience, we are going to be able to, to be more effective in our products. For example, in this study about we review, it takes, I think that it was a long time. But in the next study, qualitative study that we developed that was about dengue, in human, in human settlements, the process was quite f was faster than the will Revia. And finally, it was used in the policy making too, because we identify what were the barriers, the obstacles, or the limitations that we have in the first situation. So we could uh, manage, we could have a better management. And in a third experience with teenagers, that was another mixed study. Um, the, problem, the process was even more faster. Uh, we learned in each experience, we learned how to engage the stakeholders, the decision maker. We could uh, develop a discerning eye in order to identify the skills of, a, of a specific community members that they, they are several health providers or community members that are really remarkable in their work. So I think that the experience in the, the, the reflection about each experience could help us to make, to accelerate this process. Thank you. Yeah, I could just add to that, mm, to say that I, I, I would like to just call it like my experience in that, in my, my, my country on this is that um, not like a case on this right because like a case study might be kind of like a very kind of structured process in terms of how we could just better understand like the the specific context how this kind of like could influence uh, the specific like or like limit the boundaries of how context could could influence policy making on this and I think in that sense, like all the, the experience of my qualitative research on this could be like not very good to generalize like a specific uh, the experiences and the barriers that we actually found on that. But what, what I could think that I, it kind of like actually um, helps and could also be helpful for other experiences in, in the specific type of policies of substitution policies, um, it's the role of the different actors Right, because the actors involved in my case are very kind of like um, predictable, if I could say, right? So the, we have from one side the pharmaceutical industry, then we have the government, then we have the, the parliament, and we might kind of like see how the pharmaceutical industry will kind of like defend their interests on that, and that behavior could also be, could also be helpful to generalize like findings to another settings on and, and, and how other kind of like context could uh, influence policy making on this um, yeah I could say that like how different actors and stakeholder behave on this specific policy and how they would just kind of identify implementation barriers could also be something that could be used to another context of a policy making process Do you want to add anything? Do you would like to add anything to this discussion? On our side, um, what I can say is that in our experience, as I mentioned during my presentation, there is sometimes a mismatch between the planning at the higher level and what happens on the ground. And uh, often when we talk to policymakers, the first question they ask us is, how much is this gonna cost? So they want to know the numbers, they want to know the figures. And so it's very difficult to change the, the, the viewpoint, the mentality, to make them understand that you know, the actions on the ground will go beyond the numbers. So in our research, as I say, uh, we're trying to bring together the different stakeholders so that we can go beyond the numbers. And so the people on the ground can make their voices heard a bit more. <laughs> uh, 
I only want to say something about the methodology of the case study because um, at the beginning you decide, you choose the cases or they are similar cases and you want to find differences or they are different cases and you want to find similarities and at the end of the process when you know a lot of about each case, you found that the cases they are not really, really different or they are not really, really similar. So you have like a, the problem to yeah justify the, the findings because maybe it's a little bit contradictory. So think well. I would add, I would like to add something to this. You know, when I was discussing with our presenters this afternoon, I I was kind of getting a sense that uh, most of it are sponsored by the government. Uh, they were they were telling me like you know basically I wanted to discuss like but there are also settings where uh, researches are not part of the priority for government decision making then wh how researchers especially um, researchers who are into health policy or public health or s health systems research would try to strategize to bring that in the agenda or you have done a research or you have done um, you know, I'm using qualitative research methods, for example, case studies or very pertinent observation. And how do you bring that to decision-making agenda? Any comments from the? Ob Good afternoon. My name is Kuba, and I work uh, with Kara on the same project. And like she mentioned, we have several studies feeding into the main agenda of building capacity to uh, enable uh, rural communities to access surgical care. And one of the things that we identify is that, it, uh, particularly in Malawi, health workers leave the government sector because of la delays in promotions or uh, lack of uh, basically financial incentives for them to stay. So that we conducted a rapid qualitative study finding out what is going on, why these people are leaving, and it, uh, it just prompted the results of that money is the big thing, obviously. So to get that message across to the government, we assembled a meeting with the Ministry of Health, but uh, it didn't really echo that well because the Ministry obviously said, okay, look, we have no money, we have no, you know, we have no means to make that happen, to make people stay. So the next step that we figured out was to basically write a press release, to put it out to the national media, and thus the press release is just about to be printed, so if, if the the strategy behind that is like if we bring out the voices of patients saying, look, access to care for majority of Malawians is compromised because the government is, doing an, uh, is not doing much to help the key health workers to stay where they need to stay and operate. Uh, that in our, the, the hope is behind that, that, you know, that might create some momentum around that and make people realize that the decision making level that, look, there is an issue that they need to address because people are getting uh, upset to have lack of action, or the people themselves realize, look, there's something that, go that is going to affect me, my sister, if she's pregnant, if she needs a cesarean section, for instance. So that's how we kind of went beyond research and beyond the qualitative evidence. You use the qualitative evidence to synthesize it in kind of a lay article and put it out in the media. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing home some, um, you know, a very, from a very different setting. and. Uh, example would also help us think. I'm sure um, we all work in different settings. Uh, some are supported, some are with challenges, but we have to keep going. And with this Q symposium, I think we are very energized and we are hopeful. I'm, I'm sure many people, I think first day, zero day, I remember some of the participants in my workshop. I was asking like, what brings you here? And I think uh, one of the person told me, um, Qualitative data is not seen as a hard data. It's not, it's not seen seriously. I hope we go back from here thinking uh, or having support of this community with us and feeling energized. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being uh, attentive and um, be part of our journey. Thank you so much. <laughs>